your Bibles this morning to Psalms chapter 92. Psalm chapter 92. We're going to begin in verse 12. Last week, of course, we've been talking about being rooted, and uh, we've been in this series now for a couple months, and just talking about being rooted, being planted, um, being planted in the Word of God, being planted in a local church. And so those of you that are reading through the Bible with us, we've been reading through the Bible in uh, 90 days. We're calling it B90X, 90 Days of Spiritual Fitness. And we're just about halfway there. We've got a, a few more, probably another week or so before we're halfway there. But I'll tell you what, uh, it is a blessing, isn't it? Amen. Those of you that are doing it with us, I'm, ta- I'm talking to people all the time, and they're sharing what God's showing them and seeing things in the Word that they've never seen before and uh, just getting revelation. Amen. Yeah. I can't, you can't go wrong reading God's Word. So we've been doing that, and especially doing it in that amount of time, reading through the Bible you know, in 90 days, you get a lot more than you would get if you just spread it out over a year or something like that. And it's a commitment. I know it's a commitment, but I want to encourage you, if you're doing that with us, don't give up. Keep going. Keep pressing. It's going to be worth it, and it'll be a big accomplishment when you're finished. Amen? All right. Psalm chapter 92, verse 12. started talking to you last week about being planted in the local church. And we're going to continue talking about that this morning. So if you have to have a title for the sermon, we'll call it Get Planted Part 2. And I asked you to turn to Psalm chapter 92, verse 12. Let's read what the Word of God says there this morning. It says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit even in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Amen. So I love this picture that it creates for us, that uh, being planted in the Lord, you, you, he says you look, you're like a palm tree, or you're like a cedar in Lebanon, still bearing fruit in old age, always full of sap and, and green, full of life, in other words. And he says that you may declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, verse 13 says they are planted in the house of the Lord. So this is more than just being rooted in God or being rooted in his word. In verse 13, he says they are planted in the house of the Lord. And so he he puts a specific emphasis on being planted in the house of the Lord. Of course, for the New Testament believer, the house of the Lord is the local church. Amen. And so I want to continue talking about this this morning because uh, many believers across the nation are not planted in a local church. Uh, Many believers across our city are not planted in a local church. They might love God. They might love His Word, but they've sort of disconnected from the local church. And I want to uh, speak to that this morning because I don't believe that's the will of God. Now, I understand that the church is not perfect the, the, uh, because people are not perfect. But the church is the body of Christ, and it is the bride of Christ. And the way that we see the bride and the body of Christ structuring today is through the local church. And, and it's, the, it's what God set up. He set it up in the beginning. He birthed the church uh, in the book of Acts, and he's never abandoned it. He's never abandoned the church. So regardless of what your experience has been in church, if you've had bad experiences, hey, we've all had bad experiences in church. Every one of us had. And every one of us have probably had an opportunity to be offended in church um, and to leave and whatnot. But, amen, I believe that if God is for the church, and I know that he is, and if God, if his hand is on the church, if the church is who he's moving through in the last days, then I want to be a part of that. And I'm not going to unhitch from that, and I'm not going to disconnect from that no matter what. Amen. And so we talked last week. I shared this story, and I'll, I'll share it real briefly because I know we have some that uh, weren't here last week. But I shared a story last week about when I first moved into uh, the parsonage on the church grounds, one of the first churches that we worked. Uh, somebody, one of the things I wanted to do was to plant some fruit trees. And so I had a guy in the church that was a, a nurseryman, and he, he gave me some fruit trees. I believe I had an orange tree, a lemon tree, and an apple tree that I planted there. 
And I was so excited because when I saw that lemon tree, when I, get, when I went to go get the lemon tree, the lemon tree was full of lemons. But it, well, they weren't ripe yet. It wasn't time yet. And I was excited because there was probably 30 or 40 lemons on that tree. And I said to myself, you know, when I plant this, they're going to keep growing. And praise God, I'm going to have me a harvest of lemons. And uh, the gentleman that gave me the fruit tree, he said, oh, no, no that's not going to happen. He said, because when you plant it in the ground, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through a shock. And the, the, the process of being, you know, taken out of the bucket and being planted in the soil, it's going to shock it, and actually all of that fruit is going to drop off before it's ever ripe. And I was hoping he was wrong. And all of that fruit, when I planted it, it did fall off except one lemon. It had one little lemon that just kept hanging on, kept hanging on. It wasn't quite ripe yet. I was just about to pick it because, but it wasn't quite ripe, and finally that one little lemon fell off. And we lost all the fruit that was on that tree. And then he said... Not only are you going to lose the fruit this year, but he said next year it won't produce any fruit either. All because of this transplant, all because of this shocking process. He said it won't produce any fruit next year either. You might get a lemon or two. And he was right. Again, I had, I think, one lemon off of that tree the next year. Now, how did that tree go from being so fruitful to losing all its fruit, to only being able to produce one lemon next year, it was the process of being, tra of being uprooted and being transplanted. And yet we see this happening in the body of Christ over and over and over. People, uh, they don't like something at one church, and so they uproot, and they go and they transplant in another, and it takes time to start bearing fruit again. And before long, they, before they ever even start bearing fruit, something else, and they, they transplant, and they go to another church. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself every two to three years changing churches, being uprooted, being transplanted somewhere else. I'm telling you, that's not the will of God. That is absolutely not the will of God. And what it does is it, it hinders fruit production in your life. And undoubtedly, we have people that are here uh, that have left other churches. And, uh, you know, that's, that's perfectly fine. I don't, there's no issue there. But the issue is why? Why? Why, why are we leaving churches? Why, if we're Christians and we're part of a body, what's the reason? Now, I will say that there are legitimate reasons to leave churches. There are legitimate. If if you are a part of church, there's a moral failure. Uh, if you're a part of a church that you know doesn't preach the word of God, doesn't believe the full counsel of the Scripture, doesn't believe in the in the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit and the moving of the Spirit in the church, you know there there are issues there, and I understand. But again, the the most important question is kind of what I said during the offering: What is going to please God, and what is going to cause me to walk in obedience to Him? What is He saying in the whole process? I'll say it's very unlikely that God's going to have you leave a church because of you got offended or you didn't like somebody in the church. I'd say that's probably real unlikely. I'd say he's going to probably direct you to the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> talk, talk to you about turning the other cheek. And, you know, I mean, it's just the truth. But uh, sometimes that happens and people leave churches for different reasons. But what I'm, and I'm really not <clears throat> uh, trying to bring, you know, correction or anything to if you're here and you left the church. I'm not really trying to do that. All I'm saying is uh, you can't do a lot about the past, but the present and the future, we can, we can do things differently. Amen? Uh, no matter what's taken place in the past and no matter how we've conducted ourselves in the past, we can see what the Word of God has to say about it and we can go forward in a new way. We can go forward in a new direction. And I believe it's the will of God for every person in this room to be planted in a local church because there are things that you need that are in that local church. It doesn't have to be this church. Uh, you know, we're not the only church in Alexandria. Matter of fact, if you go look on our website, that's one of the first things that we say on our, the who we are section. And there's a section that says who we are not. And one of the things we say on there is we are not the only church in Alexandria and we're not trying to be. Uh, you know, people have left this church and they've got connected somewhere else. Praise God for that. And that sometimes God moves people and that's, that's perfectly fine. However, if you know God's called you here, if you know God's called you to this church, then the answer is to get planted and get rooted in this, in this body. Amen? Now, I want to share with you a story. First of all, I, let me read this statement to you. I wrote this down in praying over this sermon. I wrote this. God has life-altering deposits for you at your church. The devil knows this, and in his effort to steal, kill, and destroy from your life, he does everything in his power to uproot you. See, there are, there are life-altering deposits 
that you need that you will not get on your own. There are life-changing things that are awaiting you in your local church. That's why it's important to get planted, and it's important where you're planted. Now, last week, I told the story of uh, Pastor Brandon and how he uh, was at a church in Shreveport and had an opportunity to leave that church, but decided to stay, even though there was some, uh, there was you know something that had happened. But he decided to stay at the church, and lo and behold, he met his wife at that church, and he also met me, and then he ended up coming on staff at our church. So his his destiny. I mean, those are not small issues. Who you're going to marry, <laughs> uh, where you're going to be launched into the ministry. I mean, that's that's not a small thing. Um, and yet, he had an opportunity to leave, didn't do it, and because of it, he's still in the, the will of God for his life today. Now, uh, I asked myself this question, well, what would happen if he had left? What had happened if he decided to uproot himself before he met Jamie, before he met me and we built the relationship? Well, I dare say he would be doing what a lot of believers are doing today, is walking in circles asking this question to God. Why? Why, why, why? Why hasn't this worked out? Why am I still not married? Why? I know I have a call of God on my life. Why am I not in the ministry today? It's not to say that he would have never been married or that he would have never found his way into ministry. But And people like to say that. They say, well, you know... Uh, God would have made it work out. He would have made a way for it to work. Listen, God does not bless disobedience. If God was telling him to stay at that church and he left, then God's blessing cannot follow and come upon disobedience. We need to understand that. And we don't see that throughout Scripture. God never says, do this, and you disobey and do something else. And he goes, oh, well, I'm going to bless you just the same. Amen? That's, that's foolish. I mean, of course, we, ne- we don't see that in Scripture. We have this crazy idea, well, God's will is going to be done no matter what. His will is going to be done on people that are walking in His will and are walking in obedience to Him. But there are people that reject His will, and they go a different way, and there are consequences because of it. Now, I want to tell you another story uh, that's even a little closer to home than Brandon's story. At least it's closer to home to me because uh, it is my story. And, um, you know, I was in church as a teenager. I was, I was 15 years old, and I remember I was teaching in the youth ministry there at the church. And there, was, uh, there were these two young ladies that started attending the youth ministry. Both of them are sitting on the front row right now. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, and her sister, Jamie. And both of them started attending the youth ministry. And if you've seen Jen and Jamie, you know, they look a little bit younger than they actually are. And so when I first saw Jen, I thought she was younger than me, but actually she was three years older than me. She was 18 and I was 15. I didn't know that. And so, uh, but anyway, long story short, Jen and I began to develop a relationship. And praise God, after, you know, going through college and everything, we were married. Now, the story as why they were at that church is what's so intriguing because uh, the Starkey family lived in Dotson, Louisiana. And so for them to drive to church was about an hour and a half. Is that correct? Hour, hour and a half? And so one way they would drive to our house. Now, now listen, because the church they were going to, that we were going to, had Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, uh, Monday night was youth and Wednesday night service. Now, I met Jen on a Monday night. Now, I want to ask you how many of you would do this because they would drive in an hour and a half to church on Sunday morning. Then they would stay all afternoon going to the mall or out to eat or something. They'd stay all Sunday afternoon for service that night. Now, most people that drove an hour and a half, you know what you do, you just go home. (laughs) We're not sitting around for four hours to wait to church that night, but they were hungry for God. And so they'd stay all afternoon, go to church Sunday night, and then they would drive back in on Monday night to bring their daughters to youth group. It was at that youth group that Jen met me, we got married, and now we're pastoring this church together. Would that have happened if they'd not been rooted and planted in their church to the degree that they were willing to bring their daughter on a Monday night to youth group? But that's why I say there are life-altering deposits at your church. Life course-changing things that can happen at your church. It didn't happen the first Sunday they came, but 
months of being faithful, years of being faithful, God began to move in their life, and there, was, there were destinies that were at stake there. Now, this is not an isolated story. It's Brandon's story. It's my story. Uh, and if we went around the room, we could probably pick out people around this room that could all say, yeah, it was at my church that, that I first uh, received Jesus. There's nothing more life-altering than that. Or, or, or met spouse, or met a business partner, or on and on and on. Things that we could talk about that happened at your church. But I'm going to say to you, there are many Christians today that are not rooted, they are not planted in a local church. They attend sporadically, once a month, you know, uh, and, and they're not planted. Now, this is not a, a condemning thing, but I do want you to understand that there are consequences for that. And we have to know about them and we have to acknowledge that. Because it's only when we get fully planted in our church are we going to see the full benefits that God has for us. Amen? Now, I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. I don't know why y'all are so quiet this morning. Y'all are all here. Y'all don't have, have nothing to worry about. Y'all are all at service today. It's the ones that aren't here that ought to be listening to the message. Amen? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. I'm reading out of the King James Version, and it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We're all probably very familiar with this scripture and have heard it many times, but I, I want to read it to you out of the New King James Version because actually uh, the King James really doesn't bring out the full meaning of what's here because uh, the word, when you look at it in the Hebrew, this word vision uh, is not really talking about the type of vision that we might be used to. It's talking about a prophetic vision. It's talking about revelation. And even this word where it says the people perish, it's not talking about that they, they die or they're destroyed. What it actually, when you look the word up, it actually means to, to be loosed or to cast off restraint. This is the way the New King James Version reads this scripture. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Okay, and that's actually a more accurate translation of what is here. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. So what you could say is, the more revelation you have, the more restraint you have. Because that's really what this scripture is saying. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Now, when we read through the Old Testament, you'll see times where uh, the word says that, you know, uh, a word from God or a prophetic word from God was rare in, in a particular time or uh, God wasn't speaking as much during a particular time or season. And what you see is a fulfillment of this scripture when that happens. The people would cast off restraint. They would turn to idols. They would turn to all kinds of sin. They would turn to all types of fleshly acts. And it's because there was no prophetic word going forward. There was no revelation that was going forth. And so it, what it resulted in, it resulted in the people casting off restraint. Now, on a daily basis, all of us have to exercise restraint in our lives. Uh, rest, you know, and the, the, the way I really want to talk about this morning is in the area of sin. You know, <clears throat> um, on a daily basis, the Bible teaches us that, you know, we have a spirit, we have a flesh. The flesh wants to do its will, which is sin. The spirit wants to do the will of God, which is to obey him and his word. But there's that battle going on in you. And he says, what causes you to be able to restrain the flesh is revelation. Revelation. Revelation coming from God's word to you that enlightens your mind, enlightens your spirit, and it gives you the power that you need to be able to overcome sin and to restrain yourself in that way. Now, have you read through... When we read through the Old Testament, you know, I'm always amazed. This happens in more than one place where, you know, Lot comes into a city and then there are some uh, angels another time that come into a city. And they come into the city and these places are just so ungodly, so much filth. Uh, so so much of a lack of restraint that they see a visitor come into the city 
and he goes in the house and the, it says all the men of the city gather at the door and begin pounding on the door because they want to bring the visitor out and rape him. You ever read that? It's a little bit shocking, you know, okay, he goes into a city, goes into somebody's house as a visitor, all the men of the city gather around and beat down, just about beat down the door because they want to rape the man, the visitor. Now, I know this is shocking and we go, my Lord, where were the police? Where were the, the people that were supposed to be helping with this? Well, it happened more than once. And what happened is those people, those men had completely cast off restraint. No restraint. No restraint in their actions to the point that they would, you know, do something of that, of that nature. And you go, well... That was then, this is now, things are different. That's true, but we get a glimpse of the lack of restraint that humanity has when something like a hurricane takes place. You know, we have opportunity to look up in, uh, in New York right now and see what's going on there. And, and worse than that, what happened in New Orleans uh, when Katrina came. You get a glimpse, we get a glimpse of humanity when they cast off restraint, what it looks like. Now... When, this, when the season begins to progress and we begin to move into the end times that Jesus described in the book of Matthew, when we begin to move into the end times that the book of Revelation describes, this spirit of casting off restraint is going to become stronger. And it's, become, it's going to become more intense. And we already see it now. We see a casting off of, of God in our schools. We see a casting away of God in our government. And what is the result? Well, it's, it's not even uncommon and it's not shocking at this point when we hear or read a story of someone walking into a movie theater and shooting 20 people. Or just a couple weeks ago, someone walked into a, a church and shot the man leading prayer. A group of 25 people just walked in, shot the man dead that was leading prayer, walked out. And it's getting to the point, how many of you remember about 12 years ago, 12 or I forget, I believe about 12 years ago, when it seems like the first school shooting happened? It was like the first one, you know, in Columbine, it was such a shock, everybody's, it's, it's just shocking that that could happen, it's not even shocking anymore. It's not even shocking. It's going to happen two or three times a year, if not at a school, at a movie theater, or at a church, or at a law office, or at the courthouse. It's going to happen two or three times a year, and we're going to read about it. And listen, that's not going anywhere. That, that's not going to get less. And this is the reason why it's so important to be connected to a local church. Because there's revelation that's coming out of this pulpit that you need that we need. And as the people of God, we have to gather together, be in prayer, be united together, and hear the revelation of God. And for most of us that are in here, we think, well, okay, you're talking about shootings and crazy stuff. That's all stuff that's happening in the world. Actually, the guy that walked in the prayer meeting and shot the guy leading the prayer, he was on staff at that church a few years before. Now, what is my point in saying that? My point is this. Do not overestimate your, your ability of restraint without God. Because you really don't know what you would do and who you would be if God were totally absent in your life. You would do things, you would say things that would shock you and shock your family with a total absence of God in your life. And that's for me as well. Because the depravity, the level of depravity in humans, it really knows no, no limits. And we see this um, in different ways. We see it raise its head in, in, in different ways. You know, I talked about a few months ago, I talked about abortion. And I talked about that since Roe versus Wade in the 1970s that over 55 million babies have been aborted. And I'm amazed at the group uh, of our nation, the, the population segment of our nation, that doesn't blink an eye at it. Doesn't think that that is an outrage, that's horrific. Well, it's a choice. You know, uh, Honestly, the choice takes place before the baby's ever born. The choice 
that a, a person has is to engage in intercourse. That's the choice. But afterwards, we're talking about a life. It's a whole different story. Actually, 3,000 babies a day are aborted. Now, look at, the, look at the outrage that takes place over something like September 11th. Close to 3,000 people were killed in one day on September 11th. And it's devastating. I mean, look at that. The terror attacks, 3,000 people, I mean, destroyed so many lives. Yeah, but 3,000 babies are aborted daily. And I don't know if we just get so used to it and, and we become numb to it, you know. Uh, and I, and I want to say this. Look, if, if, and there might be people, someone in here who's had an abortion. Look, let me say, this is not a judgmental thing for the past, Okay. Uh, this, is, this is moving forward from here. This is not something that you need to have condemnation over. If you've repented, you've you know, asked God for the forgiveness, then you, you move forward. And don't, don't let the enemy hold that over your head. But the fact remains, we're casting off restraint in that way. That's the issue with uh, abortion. But I'll tell you something else that is re- revealing the, the depravity of human nature is... Pornography. Now, my wife last night was, we were in bed and she was reading some statistics on this. And I actually don't even have it in my notes because it's not something I was planning to talk about. But the one that really stuck out to me was that in the last 12 years, there's been a 3,000%, close to 3,000% increase in internet pornography. 3,000 percent. And, and what, does it, what does it lead to? Well, we have more uh, child exploitation than we've ever had before. And I wish I could remember all the statistics because they blow you away. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of percent. It's not like just, oh, a 30 percent increase. It's like triple, double, quadruple every year the amount of children that are being exploited, the amount of children that are involved uh, in pornography, the amount of children that are being placed in the sex trafficking, slave trade. And you see it progressing. <clears throat> you see our world progressing, and it's, it all is a result of casting off restraint. We're ca- things that used to be indecent, that used to be inhumane, even for people who were not godly, It's like now they used to operate in a level of restraint, but now that restraint is being cast off, and we're seeing it more and more and more and more and more. And what I want to get across to you this morning as a believer is do not think that you're immune from that. Do not think that we can be kind of half in church and half out. We can be lukewarm kind of loosely connected, loosely planted to the church, and, but not really, you know, kind of come when we want to, and think that that darkness is not going to affect you and your family. And, you know, this is not, this is not something that I want to use to uh, bring undue uh, fear on people. It's not that, but how many know it's good to look at the truth? Amen. It's good to look at what the Word says about what the end times are going to be like. And what I see happening from the words of Jesus is that in the last days that there's going to be a great apostasy or a great turning away, a great rejection of divinely revealed truth or of revelation, which is going to result in casting off restraint, even of Christians. But I'm believing for something different at One Life. I believe that around the nation there are going to be pockets of believers that when that darkness begins to come, that that church is going to be bright. They're going to shine. The glory of the Lord is going to be seen upon that church. That signs and wonders and miracles are going to operate through that church and that in a, in a dark and a dying world that it will be like a lighthouse shining in the darkness. And that's what I'm believing for one life. That's what I'm believing for you. But we have got to move out of a complacent, you know, loosey-goosey, putting our priorities are in the wrong order. You know, everything, it seems, to some people is more important than church. It's like, if I don't have anything to do, then I'll go. But if the football game's at the wrong time, if I got family coming over, if this or such with my job, or on and on, the list goes on and on, to where church is not a priority, fellowship with other believers, corporate worship, revelation coming from the pulpit, not a priority. 
And I guess the warning that I want to get across this morning is the time to get planted and connected in a church, the time to be building your foundation is not in the middle of the darkest hour. It's before the darkest hour ever comes. So many people find themselves in crisis mode when they get hit with a crisis and they go, if only I had been prepared for this better. If only I had developed my prayer life. If only I was deeper in the Word, knew more of the Word. You know, I would be better prepared for this situation. I believe that's why the Lord has us talking about some of these things this morning. This this is an opportunity for us to wake up and say, you know what? I've been kind of loosely connected, but I'm about to go deep into the Word, and I'm about to get connected in my church, and I'm going to go after all that God has for me. Amen. So we can see from this scripture, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Now, a lot of people go, yeah, but I can get revelation on my own. Well, let me say a couple things about that. First of all, that's right. You can, absolutely. We all have the Holy Spirit in us. Praise God for that. But first of all, who is the giver of revelation? God is, through the Holy Spirit. He gives the believer revelation. The Holy Spirit is the giver of revelation. So then we have to ask the question, okay, if the Holy Spirit is the giver of revelation, if I disconnect myself from the church, if I'm disobedient to that, can I expect him to continue giving me the same level of revelation that he was? And again, I go back to he doesn't bless disobedience. I don't think that you can say, uh, well, I'm not going to go to church because I can get my own revelation on my own. Well, you just disconnected yourself from the plan of God, which is to be planted in the local church. And is he going to say, well, that was my will for you, but because you disconnected, hey, I'm just going to keep blessing you with the same level of revelation anyway? I would say probably not. And besides that, All throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God himself talks about the need for shepherds and that we are sheep and we and we need shepherds. Now, if if we didn't need it, then he wouldn't put them in place. But he has a divine order and a divine structure, and that is the way he's going to operate and flow through. And. uh, Again, that's something I'm believing for more and more in this church. And it's something I pray for on a daily basis is that the revelation that God wants to come forth out of this pulpit will come forth. And we'll receive exactly what we need for these end times, amen, as a body together, praying together, believing together. And we'll be ready for whatever the Lord has for us. You know, the more, the more a believer grows in his faith or her faith... It's true, the more revelation they can walk in. The more your prayer life develops, the more revelation you'll get in your personal prayer time. The more your Bible reading develops, the more revelation you'll get in your personal prayer time. But I'll say this. It doesn't matter how much a believer grows, they never outgrow the need for a pastor. Never. Because people... The way God set it up in his blessing, people always need a shepherd, including myself. I have a pastor. I have someone that oversees me and and looks at me that I go to when I need counsel. Other pastors that I listen to, I, I, I listen to their sermons, read their books, because everybody needs a pastor in their life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, this is the last chapter that we're going to read this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, let's start in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, and the teacher. Now, these are the five-fold ministry gifts that God gave to the church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for a purpose. Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So the job of the pastor is to equip the saints for the building up of the body of Christ. 
So the, the divine order of God is that the pastor of a church would equip the body for the work of the ministry and their doing the work of the ministry would cause the body of Christ to be built up. That's what we just read. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. So the goal of the equipping of the saints and the work of the ministry being done in the body is maturity. That's what he said right here in verse 13. To mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. When this is operating correctly, when the pastor is equipping the saints, the saints equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, the saints are doing the work of the ministry, the body's building up, we begin to move into maturity and come to a place where we're walking in the fullness and the stature of Christ. But mo- many churches, I won't say most, but many churches have it backwards. Many churches uh, operate where the pastor does all of the work of the ministry. And the saints show up to hear a good sermon. And that's kind of the pattern that happens week after week. During the week, the pastors, the staff do all the work of the ministry, and the people show up on the Sunday to hear a good sermon. That's not God's design for a local church. And what that does is it hinders the growth of the local church, and it hinders the full capacity and potential that we have as a church. This is the design right here, is that the pastor would equip the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. So that the body of Christ is not looking to a a person to do the work of the ministry, but the body of Christ is out doing the work of the ministry in our city, in our community, in the church. And I believe we're doing that here at One Life. Amen? And he keeps going. He says... The purpose of this is so that we'll mature, we'll be the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So the result, if we don't do this, if we don't equip the saints to do the work of the ministry and all grow up in the Lord, the result is is that we stay babes in Christ. That's what he says here. He says the purpose, again, of all this in verse 14 is so that we may no longer be children. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Verse 15, rather speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. I tell you what, it would do us good to go read this cha- this, these few verses over and over and over to get a clear understanding of God's picture of the church. What happens when the pastors are doing their job, the staff is doing their job, and then the people, the body of Christ is doing their job, what happens and what it looks like, the way it all flows together and the way we grow up in the Lord. But it takes people being connected and being planted in their local church. Now, briefly... We've only got about five more minutes here, but I want to give you four things that will help you get more rooted in your church. I just want to give you some practical steps real, real briefly that will help you get firmly planted and rooted in your church. The staff and I sat down a few weeks ago, and we identified four things that were present in the most fruitful, committed people at One Life Church. Now, if you don't have all four of these things, it doesn't mean you're not planted. Uh, But just the common theme, the common thread, and this was just totally unbiased. We went in with no preconceived anything. Just, okay, let's identify the most fruitful, committed people in one life, and let's identify the things that run consistent in their life. I'm going to give them to you. There's four things. Number one is they have significant relationships within the church. They have significant relationships within the church. Number two, they faithfully serve in an area of ministry. And number three, they faithfully attend Wednesday night service. And number four, They are faithful tithers. 
Now, again, I want to say, these are not four things that we wish every believer would do. We want everybody to do this. No, no, these are, these are things that we looked across our church and we saw... Let's identify the most fruitful, most productive people in our church, the most connected, most planted people in our church. And these were the four things that we saw consistent in their life. And I'll say it again, if you're missing one or even if you're missing two, it doesn't mean you're not connected or not planted, okay? And really what this is for all of us is it ought to be a, a standard and a goal that we look to. If you say, well, I'm not really connected at One Life Church, can you get better in any of these areas? You know, the first one says they have significant relationships within the church. Proverbs 18, 24 says a man who has friends must be, himself be friendly. I think sometimes people come to church and they go, well, I'm just not, I'm not connecting or I'm not meeting people. Well, uh, it's a two-way street and everybody has to put forth effort. And one of the things we do to help facilitate relationships at the church is the, the Wednesday night family dinner that we do once a month. Now, I don't know if it's a testament that everybody loves fellowship or if everybody loves food, uh, but that Wednesday night that we do the family dinner is quickly becoming the most attended service at One Life Church. We counted last week, and it was. It was the biggest, one of the biggest meetings that we'd had. So people love to eat. We love to fellowship. We understand that. But that's great, and that's the purpose of it. If, if you haven't been connected with relationships in regard to relationships at One Life, the family dinner is a great way. We, we don't have a Wednesday night service. We show up the same time. Everybody brings a potluck uh, meal, and we just fellowship, eat together, and fellowship with one another, and Oftentimes, significant relationships begin to develop in that process. Uh, number two, they faithfully serve in an area of ministry. I think the reason this results in fruitfulness and productivity is pretty obvious, but I'll just say that every Christian is designed by God to give out and to fulfill the scripture we just read in Ephesians chapter 4. We are designed to be doing the work of the ministry, and when you're not doing the work of the ministry, you stagnate. And you, if you're always just receiving the word, receiving ministry, but you're never giving out ministry, you're going to stagnate. And so when you begin to give out, the process is complete. You've received, and now you begin to give out in the children's ministry, in the youth, in the coffee shop, in greeters, ushers, media, worship. There's so many places to serve at One Life. Number three, they faithfully attend Wednesday night service. I think this reason is obvious too, uh, because what happens is, you get twice the amount of word that you would get if you only come on Sunday. You get twice the amount of revelation, which we were talking about earlier. And you have twice the opportunity to make relationships. So if relationships are important, if the word's important, if revelation's important, a person who comes faithfully on Wednesday nights has twice the opportunity to do that as someone who just comes on Sundays. Uh, you don't have to come to Wednesday night service. But I'm just saying this is something we identified in, in those that are very connected in our church. Number four, they are faithful tithers. Again, this is obvious because Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When you invest into a church, when you sow your finances into a church, your heart is going to naturally follow. It's very difficult for you to be connected in a, in a church that you don't invest in financially. And so what this is for us is it's four things that we identified that we can all look at and say, how can I get better in any of these areas? Maybe you're doing all four of those things. Maybe you can get better in, in one of those areas. Maybe you're only doing one. And, uh, and that's fine too, but it's just something for you to look at and go, well, this is, if I'm wanting to get more planted in our church, this is kind of the path. This is the thing that we see working in people's lives. Now, at the beginning of the year, we are going to be implementing some things that is going to make connecting at One Life Church much easier than it is now. We're also going to be doing some things that are going to make serving at One Life much more easier than it is now. And so we actually have Vision Sunday that's coming up in December. And uh, Brandon will be announcing it here in the next few weeks. But that Sunday, we're going to talk about the things we're doing next year because I understand, uh, while I said that making relationships, it's, it's a two-way street, but I understand there are things that we can do better as a church to help people connect. Uh, there are things that we can do better for people that want to serve, make it easier for people to serve and get involved in their church. And so we're always looking at those things and how we can make it better. And at the beginning of the year, 
we're going to be implementing some new things that are going to, that's going to make that easier for, for everyone. Amen?